In monasteries scattered across the Indian Himalayas, exiled Tibetans try to keep alive an ancient religion and culture. But after half a century of exile, and with reports of increased repression and violent death coming from their homeland, are they running out of hope for a free Tibet? Prayers and music which echo across the hills of Dharamsala in northern India have hardly changed since Buddhism was introduced into Tibet in the 7th century. Inside their monastery, Lobsang and Kanyag, who both fled Tibet a few years ago, use the tools of the 21st century to get the news from back home. They've just been told that another Tibetan has set fire to himself in despair about the Chinese occupation of their country. They're told the police threw his body into a truck he was still raising his arm and shouting, free Tibet. He died the next day. Once they hear from three different sources, they send the news to Tibet support groups and journalists. Our greatest concern is to protect our sources inside Tibet. We are very aware of the risks they are taking. Since 2008, people there have been arrested for simply being in touch with us. Four years ago saw an abrupt downturn in Chinese treatment of Tibetans. Beijing's Olympic torch was met in nearly every city on its journey, London included, by demonstrations in support of freedom for Tibet and the Dalai Lama. Sorry, I'm just going to say, Connie Hutt now, he says, oh, someone, as I speak, someone has tried to grab the torch from Connie Hutt, the former Blue Peter presenter. Someone has, a man, has tried to grab the torch. He's been hauled to the ground by police officers. He did have his hands on the torch for a few seconds. As news of the demonstrations reached the rooftop of the world, Tibetans rose up against their rulers, and the protest spread from Lhasa in the Tibetan Autonomous Region to the millions of Tibetans who live in Qinghai and Sichuan provinces in China. It was here that the most brutal crackdown then took place. Locals claim that dozens were killed and hundreds arrested, numbers which we can't verify because the area was then and is now forbidden to journalists. Lobsang, a monk who has since fled China, was there at the time. Since 2008 and the crackdown, we young Tibetans have become politically aware. Nearly all those monks who've made themselves into human torches are about my age, 18 years old. We saw the suffering of our people in 2008. We watched as monks were taken away to prison for up to 18 years. We saw bodies piled up in the courtyard of our monastery, Kirti Monastery. As children, we learnt what injustice means.
monks from the Kirti Monastery in Naba County, the largest and traditionally most defiant monastery in the area, led the protest in Sichuan in 2008. Here at their twin monastery in India, their fellow monks anxiously look for the faces of those who are killing themselves today. There have been more self-immolations at Kirti than anywhere else. Kirti Rinpoche is the head of the monastery both here in India and in China. The recent self-immolations expressed the pain not just of the monks, but of the entire Tibetan people. It was Chairman Mao who once said, when there is repression, the people will revolt. This is the Tibetan way of revolt. Since 2008, hundreds of monks have been arrested, religious services have been disrupted, they've hung posters of Mao next to the Buddha. If the Chinese continue like this, the self-immolations will continue. We are about to show disturbing images of some of these self-immolations which Tibetans have smuggled out of the area at great personal risk. A 20-year-old nun, Tenzin Wagmo, sets fire to herself on a street in Naba County in October. She was the tenth to do so. Since they began just over a year ago, there have been more than 30 self-immolations, most of them monks and nuns. They tend to swallow kerosene first and cover themselves with barbed wire to prevent anyone stopping them from burning to death. A few may have survived, no one's too sure. I was shopping in Narba town when suddenly two monks ran down the street in flames. One was holding a Tibetan flag. One of the monks shouted, we want freedom in Tibet and we want the return of the Dalai Lama. After a few minutes, police, firemen and soldiers arrived. They put out the flames and threw the two monks into the back of an army truck. We were told they were being treated in hospital, but no one has been allowed to visit them, and so we don't know whether they're alive or dead. I found Norbu among the latest arrivals from Tibet at the refugee reception center in Delhi. They were exhausted but relieved. Some of them had walked 18 days across the Himalayas to get here. A few years ago, several thousand Tibetans fled to India every year. Now, they tell me, more want to escape, but with tightened security, only a few hundred succeed. Norbu doesn't want to be identified because he still has family back in China. There are now three military camps surrounding the monastery and plainclothes police are everywhere. There are checkpoints on every road, the internet cafes have all been closed and so has the public telephone office. It's as if we Tibetans have been shut up in a room and the Chinese have locked the door. They want the Dalai Lama to return to Tibet, but he's been living in India since he fled Chinese rule over 50 years ago. At 76, he's announced his retirement as a political leader, leaving that role to a prime minister in the government in exile. He retains his role as spiritual leader of some five million Tibetans, and yet has remained strangely quiet on the subject of the self-immolations. As a spiritual leader, I think there's some surprise that you haven't come across more strongly condemning what they're doing. 
Now this is very, very sensitive political issue. If I involve that, then the retirement from political power is meaningless. You can't say anything you're saying. Uh, whatever I say, the Chinese government immediately manipulate. So now, as far as the, the government is concerned, now they really very very hardened. Uh, they do not understand what's the real Tibetan feeling. Children sing of a Tibet they've never seen. A third generation is now being born here in India, to where their parents and grandparents fled to be close to the Dalai Lama and for children to be taught about their language, religion and culture, for which there is little opportunity inside Tibet. Older children, who've arrived more recently, say it's the lack of freedom of expression in Tibet that is making young people take desperate action. She uh, used to help the old ladies and to bring the waters, and that way all the neighbors love him. This recently arrived teenager was a friend of an 18-year-old who died last November. He has no any opportunity to express what the Chinese are doing in Tibetan. If we stand up and say something, we are going to be present or going to be killed. And if he writes something, his writings were not going to anywhere. Chinese will confiscate all things. And he's going to make trouble with the family. So what made him kill himself? That's only the options they have whether it is good or not. When the Lobsang Jiayong was on a fire, Chinese police came and they caught him and beat him because Lobsang Jiayong is on the fires. So the police clothes got on fire. So later, the police are demanding the family to Lobsang Jiayong's family that they need a compensation for burning of their own clothes. Some 150,000 Tibetans have fled to join the Dalai Lama in India. They've seldom questioned his policy of non-violence and the middle way. That is, to abandon any claim to restore an independent Tibet, but to appeal to Chinese goodwill to grant them real autonomy within China. Repeated meetings between his representatives and successive Chinese governments have come to nothing. Our approach more or less failure to get some sort of close understanding with Chinese government and some improvement inside Tibet in that aspect completely fail. These leaders, very foolish, narrow-minded, authoritarian sort of people, only their mouth, no ear. Never willing to listen to others' view. But the Chinese are listening. The Dalai Lama moves around even here at home with armed protection. But his support team claim that the Chinese are using the electronic weapons of the 21st century to get at the leader they accuse of being a splittist, of wanting to separate Tibet from the motherland. A British cyber expert who's been asked to investigate says the Chinese undermine any attempt by the Tibetans to seek help from the international community. So if, for example, the Dalai Lama had requested a meeting with David Cameron or Barack Obama, mm. the Chinese would intervene to try and stop it? Well, that's exactly what's happened in the past. 
the secretarial staff had noticed some uh, any number of strange uh, coincidences, as it were, where it appeared that Chinese diplomats had intervened in advance of meetings that could only have been known about through intercepting email. Yeah. yeah. At the same time, the threat that keeps me awake at night is more to do with uh, ordinary Tibetan people, who, for example, who might return to Tibet, uh, who've ca been caught up in this surveillance network, which it, you know extends well beyond the borders of of China and Tibet at this at this point. Counterattack begins. Our troops attack and occupy the rebel positions on Yowang Hill. Conflict between China and Tibet goes back centuries. The Chinese justify their most recent invasion in 1950 by claiming that they were liberating the Tibetan people from a feudal theocracy. The Dalai Lama himself admits there was a lot that was wrong about Tibet at the time, and as a young man, he was committed to reform, but he never got the chance. In 1959, the Tibetans rose up against Chinese rule. His life was deemed to be at risk, and he fled to India. Here, he has promoted the idea of a government in exile, with an elected parliament and prime minister, an indication of what Tibetans would do if ever they were to rule themselves again. But such a prospect has never looked more remote. As one MP says, the self-immolation of one young man in Tunisia in 2011 set off a chain of revolutions in the Middle East, supported by the international community. They point out that more than 30 in Tibet during the same period have been largely ignored. What we really appeal to the international community, particularly the General Secretary of the United Nations, to send a fact-finding delegation, to send envoys to the ground and assess what is going on, how best to end this. Uh, Tibetans are treated as second-class citizens in their own homeland. It's a grim situation, hence the Chinese leaders ought to rationalize and realize that if they really want to be a respected rising power in the world, they ought to demonstrate respect to the Tibetan people. It's a two-way process. Till you respect Tibetans, others will not respect you. They might fear you, but they will not respect you. But the Chinese show no inclination to reopen negotiations, let alone show respect to Tibet's leaders in exile. Only the Dalai Lama remains the eternal optimist, still believing that they will change. Any sensible leader will not carry continuously this kind of blind self-destruction policy. This I'm quite sure. <laughs> Only a question of time, five years, ten years, I think things will change. That's I'm quite sure. In the 20 years I've been coming here and interviewing the Dalai Lama, he's never given up hope. But among the ordinary people, I've never before come across such despair. Nor have I come across so many here who are now prepared to criticize their spiritual leader. Even those of the Dalai Lama's own age whom I found demonstrating in sympathy with those taking desperate measures in Tibet. I question the current policy and position of His Holiness not to face reality and then forcing Tibetans to commit suicide. After trying non-violent peaceful means for the last 53 years, uh, many people might say uh, in desperation that we should opt for violence.
and now we're looking at footages of nuns walking in what looks clearly like a protest. Tibetan activist okay. Tenzin Choki monitors the latest pictures coming out of the Tibetan regions. She points out that the demonstrations after each self-immolation are growing. There are those who say there were more than 8,000. Now, we don't know if it was that number or not, but it was a, a lot of people. But what strikes me as extraordinary is that 8,000 were allowed to gather without any intervention by the security forces. Um, there were truckloads of paramilitary people's armed police who came there, but uh, when they saw a huge number of Tibetans present there, they chose to withdraw. So I think they were daunted by the, the fact that there was such a huge number of Tibetans present there. And as anger increases, so does the daring of people's demands. The people have spoken, and so, and they're calling for freedom and independence. And that is something TYC is very, very committed to, even with the self immolations We're very, very um, scared that, you know, right now it has been consistently a very, very non-violent, it's the ultimate non-violent uh, method. Um, but, uh, you know, we don't know when it's going to spiral out of control. That evening, news of another self-immolation reaches Dharamsala. It used to be the Dalai Lama and his team in exile who debated the direction in which his people should go. Now Tibetans in Tibet are asserting themselves, and those in exile can only respond with candlelit processions and prayer. For what else can these people do? It's 53 years since the Dalai Lama fled Tibet, and the acts of despair being carried out in Tibet today show that people there think they're further away than ever from a solution to their problems. The path of non-violence and negotiation has apparently been exhausted. No one's too sure what to expect next. I need to do the